Hello everyone, welcome to the introduction to mechanical and industrial engineering class, MIG 130. This is the second video of part two of the mechanical design. We said that the first subject that we are going to cover through this course is the mechanical design. Mechanical design, this is a very important and wide subject of mechanical and there are some common subjects and topics that will be studied also by the mechanic industrial engineering. We said that this will be covered over different videos. This is the third video for the mechanical design, but this is the second video for the uh, mechanical design part two. Over the previous video or the objective of part two of the mechanical design is just to cover this part, this part here, which we are discussing the uh, essential types of knowledge that you should have in order to do mechanical design engineer especially your knowledge about the different machine elements or the different components that you're going to use as mechanical design engineer. What are these uh, components? What, what is the function of, uh, of each one of them? In addition, we're going to discuss the transmission systems and the different types and forms of mechanisms and how they are working. This is the main objective of this part. Uh, that's why over the previous video we have discussed the different types of mechanical components. And first, we distinguish between machine and a mechanical element or a mechanical component. We said that a machine, it is a mechanical system that consists of multiple mechanical components. So the talk here is about the single component that would be used for making a machine or would be used for making a mechanical system. We said that these components could be structural components and the objective of this structural component is just to give support to other mechanical components who are rotating or moving inside the machine. We said that what we said that uh, what distinguishes a machine from a bridge or a structure that the machine should contain some mechanisms or some of the mechanical component that form that machine should be movable. They should move. So we should use some mechanical component that gives support to, to these. Uh, mechanical uh, or movable components like these structural components like frames, bearings, axles, splines and shafts, fastener seals. So all of these different mechanical components have be been explained over the previous, previous video. And even we introduce what does it mean a mechanism. We said that this mechanism is a mechanical device that contain multiple movable mechanical components that would be used for converting or giving motion to the machine itself. So the machine without a mechanism is not a machine. The machine should include multiple mechanisms to perform a certain function or action. These mechanisms could be gear trains, belt, linkages, cams and forward mechanisms, brakes, couplings and more actually. So this is, the, this is what we already are going to discuss over this video. Over the previous video we have introduced for the gear train or gear boxes, we said that in general in a machine, it should contain a source of power, which is the engine, like the engine of your vehicle or automobile, and we should have in between a transmission system, and then we have the operating element like the wheel of your car. So this is, this is what we discussed. Also, we discussed the uh, most common types of gears that would be used for making gearboxes or the, the transmission systems of vehicles and other machines. These gears could be spark gear, helical gear, bevel gear, warm warm gear. We have discussed these two types of gears over the previous video, the spark gear and the helical gear. Very quick, the difference between them is that the spark gear is mainly used for transmitting power and motion between two parallel shafts. And the key idea of this gear is that their tooth should be straight. But the helical gear, their tools are helix and they can transmit power between two parallel shafts. Also, they can transmit power between two non-intersecting shafts. So this is what distinguishes this bar gear from the helical gear. In the meanwhile, over the previous video, we have discussed these typical shapes of the gearboxes. This is real gearboxes. And we have allocated the different mechanical components like the different gears and shafts and bearings that we have discussed over the previous video. All of these things and topics have been covered over uh, the last video, right? In today's video, we're going to continue the same line. We're going to discuss the bevel gear and the other uh, mechanical components. Then at the end of the video, I'm going to discuss, I'm going to show you how the transmission system of manual car is working. Make sense? So starting with the bevel gear, we said that the helical and spar gear, they can transmit power, especially the spar gear. It can transmit power between two parallel shafts. Like you're gonna have one shaft and you're gonna fix one or mount in one gear over this shaft 
and you're gonna have another shaft and you're gonna fix another gear, spark gear there. So this gears, when one is rotating, is gonna enforce the other one to rotate. So we should have a driver and driven. One that drives the other one. This is gonna give rotation to the two parallel shafts and the key condition should be parallel as long as we are using two spark gears. We said that for the helical gear, we can use them for transmitting power between two parallel gears or two non-intersecting gears or mutual gears as the case as shown here in this figure. We may have one shaft there and another shaft in this direction. So they are non-parallel, non-intersecting shafts to transmit power between them. We can use the helical gear for that purpose. Also, but how about the bevel gear? The bevel gear, it has a different shape in terms in comparison to the helical gear or this bar gear, it has this special shape. Uh, in addition, it is mainly used for transmitting power between two perpendicular shafts. Like you're gonna find, for example, like this case, you're gonna, this, this is the shaft, the axis of the first shaft, and this is the axis of the second shaft. So they're gonna transmit power between two perpendicular shafts. Something also that you should understand that it is not necessary that this angle, it should be exactly 90, 90 degree. It would be a little bit different than 90 degree, but it, anyway, it mainly used for transmitting power between two intersecting shafts, like one shaft and there is another shaft and the angle between them, this is what is common. In many of the cases, it's gonna be 90 degree or it could be any other degree. It could be less than 90 or even bigger than 90 degree. But in many of the cases, it is 90 degree and the key condition that they should be two intersecting shafts in that way. There is no specific distance between them. For example, if we have one shaft like this case and another shaft and there is a distance between them, this bevel gear can transmit this kind of motion between these two shafts. For that case, we need, for example, helical gear. So the helical gear transmit power between two non-intersecting shafts, but the bevel gear transmit power between two intersecting shafts, and in many of the cases, they're gonna be two perpendicular shafts. Make sense? Like this shaft for this gear, and this is another shaft for the other gear, so this is one bevel gear, this is second bevel gear, one rotates the other. So we are transmitting the motion from this direction to that direction. So we are moving the power and the energy from in two perpendicular directions as already shown over this animation or this one. A typical, very common type or example of use of this bevel gear is the differential in the real vehicles, the real, uh, real wheel drive vehicles. If, for example, I'm pretty sure some of you have, a, have an experience to see this shape before. Do you see this bucket here, down this one? This is known as the differential. This container, this is the differential of this real, uh, real wheel drive vehicle. This thing contains inside it like around five bevel gears. There are so five bevel gears already found inside this thing, but they are not seen. This is just a container that is empty inside and filled with multiple bevel gears inside it. This bevel gear, if you're gonna look at it in, uh, uh, from inside and you had a chance before to look at it, it will be seen in that form, in this way. So there would be one bevel gear that comes from the engine. This shaft is connected to the engine of the vehicle. At the end of this shaft, there should be a bevel gear, but this should be inside this container, inside the container of this differential part. And this bevel gear is connected to this bevel gear, to this big one, and there are like three rotating other two small bevel gears. This is one of them, and there is another one that is coming, right? And that connect, connected to this red shaft. This red shaft already having another bevel gear. So this group of bevel gears all are rotating. And the objective of this one is just to transmit the power and the motion that comes from the engine through this green shaft, through this bevel gear, to give this power and motion to these two shafts, the blue and the red shafts. To, to give them, so the objective actually that the power comes in this direction, we have to switch it to the wheels because these two blue and red shafts, these are connected to the wheels of the real wheel drive vehicle. The two wheels in the back, there is a differential between them that include multiple bevel gears. So the power comes from the engine in the front. Engine for any car, it should be located in the front. I'm talking about the many.
Nine, over 95% of the cars, they have their engines on the top, right, in the front. So you have the engine in the front of the car, and the power comes from the engine through the transmission, which it should be in the front as well. There should be a big shaft that takes the power and motion from the engine through the transmission to the two rear wheels. This is happening for the rear wheel drive vehicles or four by four drive vehicles. So this big shaft, which should be the green one, at the end of this very lengthy shaft, there is a bevel gear that is connected to other bevel gears inside the differential part. And these bevel gears are connected to two other shafts, one shaft to the right, one shaft to the left, which are the blue and the red shafts, to give rotation to the wheels. So now we need to convert the direction of the motion. We would like to convert the direction. The motion comes in this direction. We have to switch it in a perpendicular direction. The best gear type or mechanical component that could be used for making so is the differential and the bevel gear that used in the differential. This is also a typical example of the differential of a vehicle. This is, as I said, this is the shaft that comes from the engine. At the end of the shaft, there is a little small bevel gear that is connected to this big bevel gear. And there is inside this thing, there are some other bevel gear like this one, but they are hidden. They are not seen. That gives rotation to these two shafts. This is one shaft to the right, one shaft to the left. And we should have here one wheel and another wheel for this car. Make sense? So this is a typical and very common example of this bevel gear, how they are used for. But in fact, we are using bevel gears in so many things. We are could using them for as reversing gears to switch the direction of motion. We are using them in so many applications, so they are very beneficial for that case. This figure here represents two shafts with two bevel gear. This is one shaft. This is one shaft. At the end of this shaft, there is a bevel gear. And there is another shaft that is perpendicular to it that, is, that has also a bevel gear. And this bevel gear is K. This thing, do you see this thing here? This little small thing? This is known as key. This is the key of this. This is key. And that is fixed over the shaft that could be used for fixing other gear or something outside which is not drawn here or shown here. This bevel is already fixed or mounted at the end of this shaft. This any shaft, as we mentioned before, it should rotate. To give a free rotation to the shaft, it should be supported by at least two bearings, by two bearings, right? So what are the two bearings that support or give support to this shaft? This is one bearing. This thing is one bearing. This is another bearing here. So these are the two bearings that give support to the shaft. At the end of this shaft, there is the bevel gear. What is this thing? This is seal. Do you remember the seals? Seals are used for preventing the oil, keeping oil in a container. So usually this container or this gearbox or this thing will be completely filled with oil. So in order to prevent the oil leak outside this container, it should be sealed. Sealed, it means that we're gonna apply sealings, seals here and another seal and another seal over the other side to prevent the oil to come out of this container. And there is another shaft there is one key, so this is another key that could be used for fixing a shaft, or I'm sorry, a gear. And there is another gear that could be used for fixing another gear from the other side, but these two gears are not drawn or shown here in this figure. So this is another key, but there is bevel gear here. And this bevel gear is already k k there is a little, do you see this small thing? This is the key, which is very similar to the thing that is used for fixing the gear this bevel gear over this shaft. And this shaft is supported by two bearings. This is one bearing and there is another bearing and this is the seal that I'm talking about, right? To prevent the oil. So this is, this, this is a typical mechanism of a bevel gear, that system that could be used for transmitting the motion. If this is the input motion, it means that the motion comes from the, through this shaft. This shaft is going to rotate this bevel gear and then bevel gear, this bevel will rotate the other bevel gear to give rotation to the perpendicular shaft. So we already transmitting the bar between two perpendicular or two intersecting shafts. This is the function of the bevel gears in general. Make sense? So, so far we discussed three types of gears, spark gear, helical gear, and bevel gear. It is highly important to know the difference in terms of shape between them. What is the function of each one of them? Both are used for, all of them are used for transmitting bar and motion. This is the common thing, but this bar gear is used for transmitting power and motion between two barrel shafts. 
helical gyrus for transmitting power motion between two parallel and two non-intersecting shafts, but the bevel gear they are used in transmitting power and motion between two intersecting shafts in many of the cases they're gonna be perpendicular. Make sense? The, th the fourth type and the last type of type of bearing that, uh, gears that we are going to discuss here are the warm, warm gear. It is kind of a mechanism that they should work together as warm, warm gear. And I'm gonna explain why we do have the doubling of the warm world itself. So, warm, warm gear it is used for transmitting power between two non-intersecting shafts, material shafts, the same idea like the helical gear which works the same way, like you'd have one shaft in this direction, one shaft in this direction. So these two non-intersecting shafts, two mutual shafts in a space. So the same thing that can be happening using the warm, warm gear mechanism. And this warm, warm gear, this is the warm, and this is the warm gear. So what does it mean this? This is the warm, and this is the gear of that warm. So that's why we got the name as warm and its gear. So this is the warm, and this big thing, this is the gear of the worm, or the worm gear. So this is the worm, worm gear mechanism. So that's why we do have this name. Why we give it the name this way, it means that this should be worked like a system together. These two components working together. You cannot use one by itself. Every, for example, the worm by itself has no function. There is no single benefit of that worm by itself. The same thing for the worm gear. It means that they should work together. But for example, the previous gear, this bevel gear, I could use it, for example, if you do have a differential, an old one of an old car, you can use this bevel gear for any other machine, right? You cannot do so for this mechanism unless you use this worm with its worm gear. So for every worm, there is a gear that it is special for it. So both are working together like a single system. So that's why we got the name as warm worm gear. So it works together. How it works basically for any gear mechanism for, of all of these two previous gears, there should be a driver and driven. So what does it mean? For example, if we consider this, Spark gear. This little small gear is the driver for the big one. Can we switch? Can we make it the other way, way around? Yes. We can make the gear, the big gear driver to the small gear or the small gear driver to this big gear. It doesn't matter both the system in either directions and all either options is gonna work. So it means that any, so for any pair of gears, whatever is bar gears, helical gears or bevel gears, one, it should be driver. The second one automatically will be driven. Can we switch? Yes. We can make the driver driven and the driven driver. That is fine. We can do so for all of these types of mechanisms, of gears. But for this pair of gears, we cannot do so. All the time, the wheel should be the driver, cannot be driven anyway. It should be driver. But the warm gear, all the time, it should be the driven. It cannot be the driver. We cannot switch roles between these two gears. All the time, the warm, it should be driver. The warm gear, it should be the driven. Or in other words, you cannot, if you try to hold the warm gear by hand and give it rotation, it won't gonna rotate unless you give rotation to it through the warm. So the only thing that gives rotation to this big gear, to the warm gear, is the warm itself. This is the only thing that could give rotation to the warm gear. But for example, for any of this mechanism, like this mechanism, if you just give rotation to this shaft, to this little small shaft, if you give rotation to this one, it's gonna rotate the other shaft. If you give rotation to this one, you, it's gonna rotate the other shaft. No problem, right? You can switch roll, but we cannot do so for this case. All the time, the warm, it should be the driver, and it's driven, it should be the warm gear. So that's why they are working like a single unit. Warm and it's gear. Warm, warm gear mechanism. Make sense? The warm, it could be with, thing, with single teeth, like one teeth, and this teeth has helical shape, like it is helix around all the way. So it is one single teeth, that is already, or tooth, I'm sorry, it is one single tooth that is already helixed or, or have a helical shape all the way through the length of this warm gear, of this warm. And the other gear, 
which is the driven gear, it could have any number of tooth. So this one, it could have the worm, the number of teeth. For the worm, it could be one two tooth or two teeth or three teeth. But this one, it could be any number. It could be 20, 25, 24, 28, 72, it depends. So it has multiple number of teeth. But the worm, it comes either with one teeth or two teeth or two, uh, two teeth or three teeth. It depends on the worm itself. Make sense? And this single tooth or two teeth or three, it will be helix around the, the profile of the, or the circumference or the cylindrical circumference of the worm itself, right? So this is the other fourth type of gear mechanism that are commonly used. So these are the four common types of gears that are used in many of the mechanical components. Definitely spark gears, helical gear, bevel gear are very common. This could be used in some special mechanisms and in some special cases. Make sense? So, so far we have discussed the different types of gears. Now we're gonna move to the belt drive. But going back again, just to know what we have covered so far, we are discussing the second group. Remember that we have three groups. We have structural component that gives rotation to rotating, uh, I'm sorry, support to movable components inside the machine. And we do have the mechanism. The mechanism, these are the components who are moving themselves like gears. And this is what we discussed. Now we're going to move to the other components, belts, linkages, cams, brakes, clutches, and couplings. Make sense? So let, now let us move to the belt and chain drives. Belts and chain dri drives are doing the same thing like gears. Typically the same ge thing. Gears in general, they are used for transmitting power and motion between two rotating shafts, right? Whatever they are, parallel shafts, perpendicular shafts, intersecting, non-intersecting shafts. Anyway, the two shafts should be rotating, right? So gears are used for transmitting in general. Here I'm talking about gears in general. They are transmitting power between two rotating shafts. So, so we do have one shaft that rotate, the other one is, is rotated. Whatever, the parallel, intersecting or non-intersecting. This is what we defined before. Belts and chains, they are doing the same function. Also, they are used for transmitting power and motion between two parallel, two rotating shafts. Whatever, they are parallel, intersecting, mutually, uh, in mutual shafts in space or non-intersecting in the belts. So they are doing the same thing like gears, typically the same. But what is the difference? The difference is that gears, it has, gears has tooth. Like gears have teeth and this one has another teeth and the teeth of this gear will be engaged and meshed to the other one to transmit the motion. This type of transmitting the power and motion is known as positive action transmission of motion. It means that these three, the teeth of this one will be positively engaged to the teeth of the other component or the other gear to transmit the power. Another thing is that gear, the distance between, if we consider two gears, any two gears, like for example, if, if we're gonna consider this gear, the distance between the center of that gear and this gear, it should be dependent on the diameter or this distance, right? Which should be half the diameter. This should be the radius of this circle because it is a circular, right? And this also has a radius. So if you sum this radius plus this radius, this should give us the distance between the centers of these two gears. In other words, it means that the gears can transmit the power and the motion between two shafts and the distance between them, it should be equivalent to the diameters of these gears. So gears basically they come with certain size and they are typically in that size and they should be small because as you increasing the diameter, the gear became more heavy. This requires bigger shaft and it will be complicated to use in, in, in small machines. Like the transmission, the transmission, the entire transmission in your vehicle should be that, that size, right? So it should include some a little bit small gears, right? So it means that for the transmission of power and motion through gears, there is a limit over the distance between the two shafts. Gears are transmitting power and motion between two shafts. So there is a limit between the distance between them. But how about if you do have the distance between one shaft and the other one is too big distance? It, this, if you decided to use gears to transmit the power and motion between these two apart, 
shafts, one is over here and one of, is over there. The distance is very big distance, like one meter, two meter distance. This, if you decided to use gears, definitely you require very huge gears to transmit the power between them, which doesn't make sense. It is not applicable in terms of mechanical design. So the other option and the only option that we can have in that case is using belts. So this is the good thing of the belt, that they can do the same thing like gears, but the good thing of the belt that they can transmit power between shafts that are apart, that the distance between the shafts is very big to be transmitted or to transmit the power between them using gears. Like for example, in this case, like in the, in the motorcycle, this should be the shaft that is connected to the motor of the motorcycle. And this is the operating element. So there is a motor here, there should be some transmission system, and this is the main shaft that is gonna transmit the power from this shaft, which is located at this point, to this point, which, because this is the ax or the shaft for the other wheel to give it rotation. So we have two shafts here, two parallel shafts, and we would like to transmit the bar between them. But as you can see, the distance between this shaft and this shaft, this shaft and this shaft, there is too big distance. If you decided to use gears, you need very huge two gears that should be used here, right? Which doesn't make sense, it is not applicable. So the best option is to apply a belt, drive between them. So this is known as belt or belt to drive that you're gonna apply one pulley and another pulley over the second shaft and then you're gonna stretch a belt between them. Again, the belt should be stretched, tight in between them as we are going to explain. So this is the key idea and the basic idea of the shaft of the belt and chains are doing the same thing. Make sense? Another difference between the belt and the gears. Gears are very efficient in transmitting power and motion. Why? Because they are using the positive action transmission. Gears cannot be sliding or shifted to each other, right? Why? Because you'd have one gear that has teeth, this is the teeth of the second one, and they're gonna mesh together. So this is positive action. There is no possibility that one teeth is going to skip the other one or there is no possibility for one gear to slide with respect to the other one. There is no sliding options here, right? Because anyway, the driver is going to rotate. Once it rotates, it's gonna push anyway, the driven to rotate. So the efficiency of transmitting power and motion in gears, it is very high. It could reach into up over 90 percent, but it won't gonna reach to the 100 percent. Why? Because of some of the friction between the teeth themselves, this friction, it is a dissipation of energy. It wastes energy. It dissipates some of the energy. So the efficiency of transmitting bar and all mechanical component, it is not 100%. Anyway, there should be a waste of energy transmission, whatever, through gears, belt drive, or whatever. But gears, they are very efficient. Their efficiency of transmitting bar and speed and motion between two barrel shafts, it could reach higher than 90% in many of the cases. But if we're gonna talk about the belt, the belt transmits the power between two shafts, through two bullies, through the friction between the belt, this is the belt, this black thing in the belt, this blue or sky thing is the bully. So this is the bully itself and this is the belt. There should be a contact between the surface of the belt and the surface of the bully. At this contact, there should be a friction. This friction, it should be high and big enough to give capability to the belt to rotate. Otherwise, the bully is gonna keep rotating in place while the belt itself is not moving. This is, could be an option, right? If the belt it is not tightened enough over the two bullies, the bully is gonna keep rotating while the belt is just stationary and not moving. And the bully just rotating here, so this rotation of the bully with the stationary belt is gonna give a sliding at the contact surface between the belt and the bully. And this is not good. This is have to be avoided in such a system. In order to use the belt for transmitting power, there should be a very high friction, enough friction between the belt and the bully surface. So in, in such a way that when the bully rotates, it's gonna give rotation to the belt as well. You got it? So in your point of view, based on this terminology, based on this concept, 
of transmitting power and motion through gears or belts, which one is, should be more efficient or which one could transmit more power than the other? Definitely, it is the gears. Gears can transmit more power and energy than belts. Why? They do have positive action uh, transmission. There is no possibility for one gear to slide with respect to the other one, but there is limits over the friction between the belt and the bully surface. This limit gives limit to the belt to transmit power and energy between two barrel shafts or two shafts. So the, the gears can transmit more power and energy than belts. They are more efficient than belts. The efficiency of transmitting power and motion in gears, we said that it could reach higher than 90% in some cases, but for belts, it could be 70%, 80% in that range. So gears are more efficient, make sense? Because of what? Because of the positive action clutch. Trains, they are doing the same, almost the same function like belts, but more efficient than belts. Why? Because they do have the same action transmission, as we said. Like this is the chain itself, and instead of using pulleys, we are using sprockets. So this is one sprocket and this is the second sprocket. And this is typically what exists in the bicycles. Your personal bicycle, it has these two sprockets and there is a chain between them, right? So the sprocket has certain tooth, right? It has a, a tooth that is already engaged in the space between this chain to give this kind of rotation and the efficiency of transmitting the bar in that case is gonna be higher than the efficiency of transmitting the bar through the belt. But it's gonna do the same function in case that the distance between the shaft and this shaft is huge. So the best option is to apply either a belt or a sprocket. The sprocket, I'm sorry, the chain, chain is, much, is much more efficient than belt to drive in, in doing so. Make sense? So generally a belt is used to transmit power and speed between two rotating bullets or two rotating shafts through bullets. But the chains, they are used to transmit power and speed between two rotating sprockets or two rotating shafts through sprockets. Make sense? Also a typical belt that could be used and even, some of you could have had a chance before to look at it and see this belt, is the belt drive that is used in the vehicles. That this is, these are the different, this is an electrical motor, and these are different motors and components inside the engine. So usually all the auxiliary function, car, the engine, it is not just used for driving the car. It also will be used for operating the AC, for operating the cooling system and the fan for to cool down the engine. All the auxiliary, all the functions of your vehicle are operated through the engine. So the engine, this is the, the, the source of power and energy to the entire vehicle and all these all things. So usually we do have one shaft that comes from the engine and we would like to transmit this motion and this energy that comes from the engine to the other auxiliary function like the AC, as I said, the cooling system and other things inside the car. So, but these components are distributed in the engine area of your, of your vehicle, right? And the space between the shaft that would be used for the AC is it would be uh, how, uh, the distance between that shaft and the engine, it would be big distance. So we need to set up a belt drive that could be even used to operate multiple functions at once. So we do have one shaft that comes from the engine and this belt drive is set up all between these three shafts to give them operating at the same time with the, with the rotation of the engine to operate the AC and other things, for example. So also this belt that you use for the other auxiliary functions inside your car, you're gonna see this belt to drive, okay? So we discussed the gears and their functions, we discussed the belt to drive, we discussed the chain. Now let us move to the other mechanical component which are linkages. Also some of these mechanical components that are important are linkages. Linkages, like for example, if we're gonna talk about this simple mechanism, this is a link. This thing here, it is a link that rotates. This link is known as crank, a crank. And there is another long link that connects this crank that rotates 360 degrees to this sliding th thing. So this is a slider. This sliding, this is a slider. 
that slides forth and back, forth and back. So this kind of motion is known as reciprocating motion, like it moves forward and backward, keep going all the time. But the crank itself, it rotates. So this is rotational motion. And for some reason, we are using a mechanism that converts this rotational motion into a reciprocating motion, like linear motion. This one rotates, this one is just moving linear, forth and back, which is the slider. So the crank, it should be connected to an electrical motor. There should be a motor here that gives rotation to the crank 360 degree. And there is a connecting link. So this link in between, this is connecting link all, or linkages, linkage. So this is another linkage and the crank itself there is a linkage and the connecting link there is a linkage. So these are the linkages. We are using them in general for making mechanisms that mainly use for converting one type of motion into another type like rotational motion into a reciprocating motion or a linear motion into a rotational motion. It depends on the mechanism. Like this mechanism is known as a slider crank mechanism that contains two linkages. One is the crank, the second one is the connecting rod between them, and the th third component is not a linkage, which is the slider. Slider is just slider, it is not a link. Make sense? Also a typical and very common example of uh, of a linkage mechanism is the quick return mechanism that is used in the shaper machine. Shapers, these are types of machines that is used for one of the manufacturing me methods known as shaping process. This shaping process and this manufacturing method will be explained in detail when we discuss manufacturing, but very quick it is used for machining metals. Like this is a metal part and we shape, remove something from the surface by this providing a reciprocating motion to the tool. This tool keep fo moving forth and back, forth and back, keep this repeating motion all the time. So how could we give this kind of motion? Any engine for any machine gives rotation. Any engine for a vehicle, engine like, uh, or electrical motor gives rotational motion. So the objective now is to use a mechanism to convert the rotational motion that comes from the motor into this linear motion, reciprocating motion, forth and back. How we could do so, we need a mechanism. We need a mechanism, this mechanism in many of the cases is gonna depend on linkages to do so. Like this one, this thing, which red thing that rotates 360 degree, it is a link that is connected to another linkage, which is this little small thing connected here and connected to big, this big thing is known as RAM. This is the RAM. So it's gonna keep pushing forth and back this ram. At the end of this ram, we are fixing here a tool. So this is the tool that used for shaping the workpiece or the metal part, as it will be much more clear when we discuss this manufacturing method. But again, this is one of the types of the uh, linkages mechanisms that commonly known as quick return mechanism. This is known as the crank slider mechanism. Also in the engines of vehicles, the heat combustion engine itself, it requires burning some fuel and there are some pistons that should be moving, right? So this is a piston that moves forth and back, forth and back, keep moving. And this is the valve that the fuel comes in and the burning chamber, this is the burning chamber of this fuel. When this fuel is burning, it's gonna keep pushing these pistons and this bushment and forward and backward motion of the piston should be transmitted into a rotational motion through a mechanism like this mechanism that is shown here. This mechanism contains so many linkages. One of these linkages is the thing that shows up here. This thing, this is a linkage. This, also there is another linkage here. So all of these are different linkages that gives rotation here. So once the piston moves forth and back, it's gonna keep pushing this shaft in this way that gives rotation or convert the reciprocating motion into a rotational motion. So this is also one of the mechanisms that used for. So generally speaking, a mechanical linkage is an assemble of bodies connected to manage force and movement in different directions. So the objective in general for any linkage mechanism is used for converting. This is the main objective, converting one type of motion into another type. In many of the cases, like rotational motion into a reciprocating motion, we are using these linkages to do so. Make sense? 
Also, a typical example here is the same thing that used for the uh, for the engine. So this is a typical animation of what's going on inside the engine if you're vehicle. So as you can see, there are lots lots of pistons, and these are valves that already push the uh, the fuel and the oxygen and the air and other things to perform burning of this fuel inside the burning chambers of this of this engine. So once the fuel is burning, it's gonna push this piston up and down, okay? But while this piston is already connected, so these pistons need to have linkages that connected to this shaft, known as the crankshaft, that already gives rotation to the to the engine itself. But over this shaft here, there are some special shaft known as the cam shaft. This cam shaft, it contains lots of cams. So that's why here we are discussing the cam follower mechanism. This shaft, as you can see, this little small thing that rotates, it should be very similar to this shape, right? This is the cam. So that's why we got the name of this shaft as the cam shaft. So this is the this is cam, this is another cam, another cam, and so on. So all of these cams are oriented in different directions, and they are connected to something here. Do you see this a little bit small thing that moves? This is what closes and opens the valve, which should be very similar to this follower. This is known as the follower of this cam. So we do have a cam, and we do have the follower of that cam, which has already shown here. This is the cam, and this is the follower of that cam to allow for the fuel to come in or stop flowing the cam. So this is gonna open or close the valve for the fuel to come in or out through this engine or the chamber, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the heat combustion engine itself. Make sense? So this special mechanism is known as the cam and follower mechanism. This cam follower mechanism, it is the cam, and this is the follower for that cam. So this is like one single mechanism operating together. The objective of this mechanism is used for converting a rotational motion that comes from the cam or the center of the cam, like the camshaft just rotates. So this camshaft, when it rotates through this transmission system here, is going to give rotation to the cam. This cam will gonna keep push up and down the follower as already shown here in this mechanism. So this mechanism is used for converting a rotational motion into a reciprocating motion or a linear motion. So this is one of the mechanisms, important mechanism also that used as already shown here in this heat combustion engines also used in so many other mechanical applications. So a cam and follower mechanism is a profile shaped Mountain profile shape mounted on a shaft that causes a lever, which like this one, for example, a follower or follower to move up and down depending on the profile. So this cam, it should have a certain profile or a certain shape that is crafted to this cam. And depending on the shape or the profile of the cam, the following is going to move up and down. The speed, the, the distance by which the follower moves up and down, all of these details are dependent on the profile or the shape of this cam. If you did a few did changes to this the, to the shape or the profile of the cam, the movement of the follower is going to change. So that's why this is the follower. This is what follows the cam that the motion that depend on the profile and the shape of the cam itself. Cams are used to convert rotary motion into linear motion or reciprocating motion. This is the main objective of the cam as used as a mechanism. Make sense? So, so far we have discussed some of the important mechanisms, gears, belts, chains, and the uh, these cam follower mechanism and the linkages and other mechanisms that would be used for converting types of motion from one form to another form. So as you can see, if we're gonna go back here to this part, we define a mechanism as a mechanical device that is mainly used for controlling motion or converting motion from one type to another type. Controlling motion, it means it's gonna transmit power from one shaft to another shaft, or from one place into another place, from one mechanical component to another mechanical component with a certain speed. So this is how we control the motion. Also, we could use a mechanism that could be used for converting the motion from one form to another form, from rotation, to a reciprocating motion, for example, like the case of this mechanism. So gears in general are 
gears are used for giving speed regulation or control to the motion. They mainly, they are not used for changing the type of motion. This gear is rotating, the other one also is rotating. So there is no change in the motion here type. The motion type is the rotation. The same thing for belts and chains. But these linkages and mechanisms are used for converting one type of motion from rotation, for example, to reciprocating motion or vice versa. The same thing for the cam mechanism. Make sense? Now we're going to discuss the brakes. Brakes, these are one of the important mechanical components also that used for many of the machines or like this is like a system. It is just it is not just one component, but instead it is like a system that is going to work to break down the machine. Since we're going to talk about machine, any machine, whatever it is, it should have a braking system, it should have brakes. Because this machine has movable component for some reason, we may require instantaneously to stop these components from working. They are moving, we need to stop them, like your car. If you're driving your car without brake, it doesn't work, right? You have your car, there should be brake system that you are using for your car to stop the car whenever you need. So these are the function of the brake. All of these figures are different forces, forms or types of brakes that use for vehicles, like the drum brake and the disc brake. Disc brake and drum brake. Disc brake is more efficient than drum brake, but for example, if you are already using or driving a front wheel drive vehicle, front wheel drive vehicle, it uses both. Over the front wheels, the disc brake will be seen in this form. So it is a disc and there are brake shows. So this is like one show and another show. This is are the brake shows, like two clamping pieces, specially made, that when they are clamping over this rotating disc, this disc is connected to the shaft and these screws, you're gonna fix the wheel over them. So the wheels and this disc are all connected to the shaft. So when you switch on the engine and the car is moving, so this disc here, this is the disc. So that's why we got the name as disc brake. So this disc is gonna keep rotating all the time with the same speed of rotation at the wheel. Over this disc, there are two shoes already fixed inside this clamping system. So this is like a clamping thing, like clamp, close over the disc. So you can think of it like this way, like you do have a rotating disc that rotates very fast and there is a little bit small gap between the shoes of this clamping system and the disc. It means that the disc is freely moving or rotating. Once we apply the brake in the car, there is a hydraulic system is gonna push some oil that is gonna push this clamping system to clamp, to close over the disc. And there are some braking shoes, which like made of a special material that is gonna slow down and apply a very high friction at the contact between the shoe and the disc to break down and slow down the rotation of that disc, which intuitively will give slow down motion to the shaft because the disc is connected to the shaft and hence it's gonna give slow down motion to the, to the wheel itself. This is how the brake system in the front wheel drive is working, using through the disc brakes. This disc brake is applied over the two front wheels and it supports very high force and braking force and braking motion more than the drum brake. It is more efficient than the, the disc brake is more efficient than the drum brake. So that's why the disc brake, it is applied over the front wheels in case that we are using front wheel drive vehicles. But over the drum brake, the drum brake it is another form, another type of the brake that work with a little bit different concept this is a typical shape of the drum brake from inside and this is the disc brake. So this is also the real form of or shape of the drum brake. This thing that I'm talking about, this is the brake shoe. So this is a brake shoe and there should be another shoe on the other, si other side. Right? So these two brakes are connected to some springs here. When you apply the brake, there is a piston. Do you see this thing in middle here? This is a hydraulic piston that is gonna push these two shoes apart, away. And there should be a drum. This drum it is not seen here. This drum it is like a cover. 
that is like a cover that it will be closed with this system and contain this system inside. This drum will be break down from inside when you apply the brake. When you apply the brake, this piston is gonna push these two shoes, which are pivoted here. There is pivot here and another pivot there. At this point, it means that they're gonna rotate. Uh, in this case, there are two hydraulics. It could be like using two hydraulics with these two shoes, two separate things, as it seems in this one. But anyway, this two, this two shoe will be moved apart and they're gonna apply friction internally over a drum. So the drum, it is something outside and these shoes will be internal. So when we push, these shoes is gonna keep frictioning the surface inside the internal surface of the drum to break down or to slow down the rotation of the, of the drum that is already connected or to this drum that is already connected to the rotating shafts and hence it's gonna give breakdown to the rotation of the, of the wheel. But this one is not efficient like the this brake. This can support more torquing, uh, braking torque uh, than the drum brake. So that's why in the front wheel uh, drive vehicles, the drive the disc brake is applied. We are using disc brakes over the two front wheels and drum brakes over the two rear wheels. Unless they are using, we are using four uh, disc brakes. For sure, if we are using. Uh, four by four cars, for example, we are using four disc brakes over the four wheels, okay? But these are the two commonly types of brakes that we are using with vehicles, whatever disc brake or drum, uh, drum brake and how they are used or working. So again, why we are using these brakes? To stop the machine or to stop the vehicle, if we're gonna talk about your automobile or your car. So brakes are mechanical elements in general, are mechanical com components or elements that produce a torque opposite to the operating torque. What is the operating torque? This is the torque that gives rotation to the wheel. We are using the engine. Engine gonna give power and motion through the transmission, will be transmitted through some shafts and gear to give torque, to give rotation to the wheel. So this is known as the operating torque. This is the torque needed to give rotation to the wheel to, to, to rotate and move the car. If we would like to stop the car, we have to apply a brake that is going to generate another torque that is opposite to this operating torque to stop it, to cancel this operating torque. So this is how the braking system are working. So brakes are used as mechanical components that would be used to produce a torque that is opposite. Torque is something that push that opposite to the operating torque to slow down the motion or completely stop a rotating element as needed. This is the function of the braking system in any machine. Another thing to know about these brakes are that we can apply the brakes in, on, the, on the operating element or we can implement the brakes inside the transmission system as we, if we're gonna go back again to this figure. We said that any machine has three main components, right? There is a source of power, which is the engine, there is transmission system, and there is operating element. The engine is going to work all the time. We are using the transmission system to give control over the speed and the energy transmitted to the operating element. So if this machine is working, and for some reason you would like to stop this engine or this machine, so you have two options. Either to stop the transmission system, because if you stop the transmission system, definitely the operating element as well is going to stop. In many of the cases, as long as they are con directly connected together. The other option is just to stop the operating element itself, like what we are doing in cars. In cars, we are applying the brakes over the wheels. We are not putting the brakes inside the transmission of your car. Make sense? But in some other machines, we could apply the brake internally and the brake system will be embedded inside the transmission system and it will not be seen. So this depends on the machine, how it works, whatever it is, the, the transmission is directly connected to the operating element or not, this depends on the machine itself. But generally speaking, any machine should have a braking system to stop this engine. Whatever you're gonna see it, like the case of the vehicles, and motorcycle, there is a braking system, and bicycle, there is the brakes that they are using in the bicycle, this is the braking system of this, of this machine. Or it could be internally not seen, 
like this case of many of the machine, you didn't see their braking system because it is embedded inside in the transmission of that machine. Make sense? So this depends on the machine itself. Another mechanical component or other two mechanical components that you should know the difference between them are couplings and clutches. So couplings and clutches, they are doing almost the same function, but with a little bit different thing. Both are used for engaging or transmitting the bar between two rotating shafts. Okay, gears are doing the same. Gears are used for transmitting bar and motion between two rotating shafts. The same thing, belts and drive. But these things, these gears and belts, they are used for transmitting bar and motion between two rotating shafts. And in many of the cases, we are changing the speed using them. But how about if you would like, if you do have two shafts, and you just would like to connect them to transmit the bar between them without changing the speed. So there is no need to use gears or something, especially if they are having the same axis, like one shaft and there is another shaft and they are parallel over the same axis. So they are co-axis shafts and you would like to connect them. So like typically like this case, this is one shaft and there is another shaft and you just would like to connect them. So this is like a connection, like a joint between these two shafts. But both are rotating. So if one is rotating, the second one definitely is going to rotate with the same speed, with the same torque, with the same bar, identical. These are what the couplings do and the clutches do as well. But what is the difference between them? Couplings, they provide a permanent joint or a permanent engagement. So we are connecting, engaging two shafts that rotating together at the same speed and power through the coupling and this type of connection or joint generated between them is permanent. Permanent, it means it cannot be disconnected unless you stop the engine, stop the, uh, the shafts, and then you have to remove the coupling. Make sense? The coupling, it could be embedded with the shafts, like this, this is one shaft and this is another shaft and both are coupled together. Or you could have the coupling as a separate bar that is gonna be fixed over the two shafts, okay? So the couplings provide a permanent joint or engagement between two rotating shafts. But the clutch, it gives a temporary joint or engagement between two rotating shafts and we can connect it or disconnect it whenever we need without stopping the machine or the engine. This is the difference between both. Couplings gives a permanent joint that cannot be removed unless you stop the machine and, and, and fix or remove the coupling. A typical example for a coupling case is the shaft that feeds the differential of a real wheel drive vehicle. Do you see this shape? I'm pretty sure some of you could have an idea or have had a chance before to see this shape or this thing before underneath a car that is real wheel drive vehicle. Like if we're gonna go to this figure again, do you see this thing? This is the differential that we were discussing, right? How this differential is working? We said that it includes so many bevel gears. One of these bevel gear, it should be connected to a shaft that comes from the engine. So there is the engine in the front of the car and there is the transmission and there should be one shaft that is projected out of this transmission. This shaft basically, it is very lengthy, very long shaft that covers the entire length underneath the car. At the end of this shaft, it should be connected to the differential. Make sense? that gives the rotation to the bevel gear, to the other bevel gears as we explained here. You got it? So this is the shaft that I'm talking about. This is the shaft, which is known as the differential shaft that comes from the engine. At the end of this one, there is a bevel that gives to the differential that connects to the other rear wheels. So this is if we are gonna go to this shaft again, this is the shaft that I'm talking about. This is the shaft that comes from the engine. This big shaft, this is the thing that comes from the engine and which should be connected to the differential. So this is the input, this is the entrance to the differential thing. 
there is a little bit small shaft here. This shaft at the end of it, there is a bevel gear, but it is inside the differential not seen. You got it? But here we are applying coupling. We are using coupling here. This coupling is kind of flexible coupling. What does it mean flexible coupling? As already shown in this animation. Flexible, it means that this shaft that comes from the engine, and this is the shaft that goes to the differential. There is a junction between them. We are applying a flexible coupling. It means that this one can freely rotate with respect to the other one. So it is, this is permanent joint, yes, but it is flexible. It can freely, one can freely rotate. This one rotates about its axis. This one rotates with the same speed of rotation, but they can be bended to each other. So they are flexible. This type of coupling is known as flexible coupling, but it is a permanent joint between them. It cannot be disconnected unless you stop the car and you remove the coupling. Make sense? Why we need it flexible in that way? Because for example, the real wheels in the car, these two real wheels are supported by a suspension system. This is the suspension system in the real wheel that if there is corrugated road or a bump over the street or something, these two real wheels, they're gonna go up and down with the bump over the street, right? These two wheels, to give these two wheels the ability to move up and down depending on the condition of the road, we needed flexible things. The shaft that comes from the engine, it should be fixed. It shouldn't be movable up and down. It means that this shaft that comes from the engine, it should be fixed in place. And the other shaft that is connected to the differential, it should be flexible because we can move this one up and down. So if the real other, the real, the two real wheels are moving up and down, this shaft that is gives and feeds the differential, it should be freely to move up and down depending on the root conditions. So we need something to do so, which is the coupling in between, which is already used in this vehicle. So if this part on the back, this part on the right, if it's gonna move up and down, this shaft is gonna be freely moving up and down while this other shaft is just rotating that feeds from the engine. This is how we are using these couplings for. And there are so many other applications for couplings. For example, there is another differential that is located over the front wheels. In, in case that we turn right or left, in the front wheel, there should be two couplings over the two front wheels. So we do have one wheel to the right, one wheel to the left. And there should be a shaft as well that feeds these two wheels to rotate. So when you turn right, when you just steer the wheel, the steering to the right or to the left, what's happening to these two front wheels, they're gonna rotate right or left. So when the front wheel rotate right, you need something here, there should be a shaft. There should be a shaft connecting these two wheels together, right? So at this junction between or connection between the wheel and the shaft, it should be flexible to give free rotation and keeping the shaft in place. This horizontal shaft, it should be horizontal and in place all the time while the front wheel rotate right and left. The left wheel, it will be rotated right and left. So we need one coupling here, another coupling there. So couplings are used a lot and so many in so many different types of machines also one of the important mechanical components. The key idea that you should understand about couplings, a coupling is a device that is used to connect two shafts together, connect two shafts together at their ends for the purpose of transmitting power and it provides a permanent joint or engagement of these two shafts. This is the coupling. So what distinguish, and this is important, what distinguish the coupling from a clutch the coupling gives a permanent engagement or connection of two shafts at their ends to, with the purpose of transmitting power between them. It could be flexible or non-flexible, it depends. But anyway, it's gonna provide a permanent connection and engagement between the two shafts. But the clutch, the clutch, it gives a temporary connection. We can connect and disconnect whenever you need. So a clutch is a mechanical device or a mechanical component that is used to connect or disconnect two rotating shafts at their ends as needed, as we need. When we need to connect, we're gonna connect. We need to disconnect, it's going to disconnect. This is the function of the, the main purpose of the clutch, and this is what distinguishes a clutch from a, a, a coupling. Make sense? 
a very good example or a common example of the clutch is the clutch that is used in the manual cars. Even automatic cars, the automatic transmission system, they do have clutches, but they are embedded internally inside the automatic uh, transmission system. It is not seen. But it's going to be very clear if you had a chance before to drive a manual car. You're going to know the clutch. The clutch in the manual car would have three buttons, as already shown uh, here in this figure. One is the accelerator or the gas, which speed up the car. And this is the brake and this is the clutch. For who had a chance before to drive a manual car, in order to drive this car, first you have to press, once you switch on the engine and the car is not moving, the engine is working. This is something also that you should understand. The clutch is located, what is the location of the clutch in your vehicle? The clutch, it comes just next to the engine. You'd have the engine, then the clutch, then the transmission. So the clutch is the thing that connects the engine to the transmission system. This is the clutch. This is like the engine of the vehicle, fuel car. This is this orange thing. This is the clutch, like a disc. And these gears that already included inside your transmission system of your vehicle. Make sense? So this is how it works. This is how it looks like. So the clutch is located between the engine and the transmission. There is a clutch here. So in the manual car, how it works, how it works. Here I'm talking about the manual car. When you switch on the engine, the engine is gonna work. So the pistons will be working and there should be a little bit small shaft that comes from the engine that is going to rotate. This shaft will be connected to the clutch first. The clutch is going to kind of either connected or disconnected. Now, if you are not pressing your foot over the barrel, if you if your foot is off the barrel of the clutch, the third one, which is C, so the clutch is connected. So again, if your foot is off the barrel, the clutch barrel, it means that the clutch is connected. Connected, it means that the clutch connecting the transmission to the engine. So you could, could deal with the clutch, this is like a switch. Like switch on and off, connect, disconnect. If you're removing your foot off the clutch barrel, the clutch will connect the motion between the engine and the transmission. But if you press the clutch completely, barrel com com completely, you're completely disconnecting the motion between the, uh, the engine and the transmission system. Make sense? So what we basically do when we drive our manual cars, we switch on the engine without pressing any one of these barrels. It means that the, the clutch is connecting. It means that the clutch connects the motion that comes from the engine to the transmission. But in the meanwhile, the car is not moving. What does it mean the clutch is connecting the transmission to the engine? It, mean all the, uh, it means some of the gears inside the transmission, these are the gears that located inside the transmission system, some of these gears are rotating. It means that the transmission is working. There are gears there and they are rotating with the rotation of the engine while the clutch is connecting. But in the meanwhile, the car is not moving. Why? Because the stick, this is the stick in your manual car, it is switched to N, which is neutral. It means that you are switching to a gear that disconnecting the motion from the transmission system to the wheels. The connection from the, tr the transmission to the wheel is disconnected. So we have four things. Engine clutch that connect the engine to the transmission. And there is another connection from the transmission to the, to the wheels. That already this connection between the transmission and the wheel is already embedded inside. It is one of the gears inside the transmission itself as it will be explained in the, in the transmission system of the manual car. Make sense? So as, as long as this stick is over N, it means that there is no transmission. There is no movement comes from the transmission going to the wheels. So that's why the car is not moving. How could we move the car? If you are really driving a manual car, you just switch on the car and the car is not moving. The engine is working, everything is working, the car is not moving. How we could move? First, you have to press the barrel all the way to, uh, to disconnect the clutch. So if we press the barrel, the clutch is disconnecting. Disconnecting what? Disconnecting the engine from the transmission. 
It means that the engine is working and the transmission, it is not necessary to be working in that case because it had been disconnected by the clutch. You have pressed the clutch barrel all the way down. Then this gives you ability and freedom to move the stick to shift the gears. But if the clutch is still connected, it means that more power and pushing comes from the engine. If you try to move the stick without pressing the battery, you aren't going to be able to do it. The gears, you are not giving ability to gear to disconnect one gear and engage or, or connect it to another gear. To able to do a gear shift in the transmission system in the manual car, you have to press the battery all the way down. Why? To disconnect in a new pushing. In a new push and motion and energy comes from the engine to the transmission. You have to disconnect first through the clutch. So this gives you ability to shift the gear to the first gear. Once you do so, you have to keep still, keep your foot over the barrel, the clutch barrel. Then you're going to remove your foot steadily, step by step. And in the meanwhile, you're going to keep pressing over the accelerator or the gas barrel, right? To keep, to allow the, for the car to move. And the condition is that we have to remove our foot of the clutch steadily, step by step, one by one. Why? To give ability for the clutch to connect. As you remove your foot from the battle of the clutch, the clutch is going to start to collect its blades and connect the engine to the transmission again. But this should be done steadily, easy, step by step. If you try to do it suddenly, the clutch won't be able to connect, so the engine won't stop. Right? The transmission won't gonna work. The clutch won't gonna able to give the enough connection between its plates to connect the motion to the transmission system to, to, so the car will stop. So otherwise you have to do it easy, step by step. You have to remove step by step to allow for the clutch to connect for the motion that comes and the pushing and the energy that comes from the engine through the transmission to give motion to the wheels and rotation to the wheel to move your car. Then till you're gonna re completely remove your foot from the, from the clutch barrel, in that case, the clutch will be completely engaged, will be completely connecting the engine to the transmission system and transmitting power and motion. If you would like to shift the gear, you have to repeat the cycle again. You have to press the clutch all the way down, disconnecting any new pushing come from the engine, shift to the second gear, then remove it steadily and so on. This is how the manual car is working. Very simple. Make sense? In the automatic cars, these clutches are embedded inside the transmission system and they are working automatically with the automatic transmission system. In the manual automatic cars, we don't have this third button. We do have only two battles here. We do have the, this accelerator and the brakes and that's it. We don't have, we, we need to have the clutch. Why? Because it is automatically embedded inside the automatic system. So it is embedded with the gears inside the automatic uh, transmission of the automatic vehicles. Make sense? The clutch, it, this is like a typical structure or shape of a clutch. So that's why we give it in a name as mechanical device. It has so many mechanical components. These are known as the uh, plates or the discs of this clutch. So this one of the type of the clutch would have so many types of clutches. This is the one that is used in vehicles. This is the typical shape of that clutch. It is known as the disc clutch or plate clutch that uses these plates. So these plates are frictional plates and they are the clutch transmitting power and motion between two rotating shafts by friction. So how by, how by friction, like you do have one shaft rotates Assume that this shaft that is the one that is connected to the engine. Assume that this is the engine shaft. And there is one disc here. Assume that. And there should be another disc over another shaft. And this shaft is connected to the transmission. So this is the transmission. And these are two plates, like these plates, kind of. So if the distance between these two blades is the, if these two blades are not contacting together, it means that the clutch is disconnecting this shaft from the engine, from the shaft to the transmission. So there is no motion. 
But if there should be like a spring system, this device includes lots of springs and other things that are gonna push one plate over the other one. So these two plates will be pushed against each other to be completely in contact together. So if the motion comes from the engine, the shaft, this disc over the engine, this disc all the time rotates. This one rotates all the time. When we press the other one to it, it's gonna, because of the friction between them, it's gonna enforce the other blade to rotate in the same direction of rotation. So you are sticking them together and because of the friction, they're gonna having the same rotation of motion. So that's why we say that when you apply the brake, you have to remove your foot steadily, step by step. Why? To allow for these plates to engage together and allow for the frictional force to be generated because this frictional force that comes due to the pressure over the two blades, it won't gonna be generated maximum at once. It takes time. So that's why you have to remove it steadily, step by step, to allow for these frictional surfaces to work together perfectly and fit together to give rotation or to enforce the other shaft that is connected to the transmission to rotate, then to move the car. This is how it works in the transmission system that mainly use for the, the clutch that used for, uh, for the vehicles. Make sense? So, so far we have discussed the different mechanical components and there are more that could be used for making mechanisms. We have discussed the common things that you would experience in your vehicle or in your, in your car. Make sense? In addition to these mechanical components, there are, so, so far we discussed two groups of mechanical components. There are some components that would be used as a structural element to give support to other movable element, there are some other components that are moving themselves. They are moving for that use for making mechanisms. There are a third group of other mechanical components or components that use be would be used for making a machine, which are the control components, like buttons, switches, indicators, sensors, actuators, computer controllers, or anything that would be used for controlling the operation of the machine is a part of the machine. So generally, any machine, it contains all of these different mechanical components together who are working together to form a machine that can do a specific function or objective. Make sense? So these are the different mechanical components that we have discussed over uh, these, uh, these two videos so far. We discussed these uh, gears, uh, belts. In this video, we discussed the other types of gears, the belts and chains, in addition to these mechanisms, the brakes, the couplings, and the clutches. Make sense? Next, what we need to discuss is the transmission system of the car in detail, how it works, how we could shift between the first gear, the second gear, all of these details will be covered, but I will cover these things over another video, which will be the next video uh, or the next lecture meeting. Okay, so that's it for, for today. The objective today just to give you an overview about these different uh, mechanical components and the function of them. I've spent some time explaining these clutches and these couplings and other mechanical components, how they are working, because I believe it is uh, interesting to know how these things are working. But in the exams, for example, definitely, I won't gonna ask you to explain all of these details. This is just for your knowledge to just to know or your, for your information about these mechanical components. But there are some things that you should acknowledge the, for example, the difference between couplings, clutches, uh, in addition to the other mechanical components, like the difference between belts, gears, what is the function of the gears, the different types of gears, what is the function of belts, chains, and these different uh, issues, okay? So again, over the next meeting or the next video, I'm going to explain to you how the transmission system of the vehicle is working and how we could shift between different gears by considering this simple example of the transmission of the, of the, of the car. All right, thank you so much and see you in the next meeting.